Good afternoon, everybody. You are about to watch the Palai Bible Church program, the moment of transformation. Today, by the grace of the Lord, we shall listen to our pastor, General Superintendent, Pastor W. F. Kumoyi. We are going to be blessed. It is my wish that you call your family to come and listen to you, as our pastor is blessing you with his holiness message. Amen. Blessed. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is peculiar in different ways because it marks the very beginning of a very great section in the epistle to the Romans. Actually, as you look at the epistle to the Romans, you have 16 chapters. And these 16 chapters are divided into three parts. Number section 1, chapters 1 to 8. And in section 2, you have chapters 8 to 11, and then the final section you have uh, chapters 12 to 16. In the first section you have something very doctrinal, and it's talking about a salvation, a justification. It's talking about Jesus Christ as Savior, and it talks about the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. It moves on to chapters 2 and chapter 3, first of all, seeing that all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Chapter 4 tells us about our redemption, that is not by works, our justification, not by works, our salvation, not by works. It is by what Jesus Christ has done. And chapter 6, is chapter 5, is still talking about being justified by faith. We have peace with God. And it talks about the grace of God, the abundance of that grace, and the gift of righteousness coming into our lives. From chapter 6, it's not talking about something a little bit beyond what he has said in chapter chapters 1 to 5. It's talking about the crucifixion of the old man, the death of the old man. That is our sanctification, that is our holiness, that is the purifying effect of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And then it comes to chapter 7, he goes a little bit back to the old man. That is, this old man that's not able to fulfill the will of God. I, I wanted to do good, I couldn't do it in my sinful state, in my depraved state. But he says, now Christ has come. And then he comes to that chapter 8, he begins chapter 8 with no condemnation. And he finishes chapter 8 with no separation. No condemnation now for the people that are in Christ. And no separation for the people who are in Christ. No condemnation, no, se no separation. Now, that first part, chapters 1 to 8, is doctrinal. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are peculiar because they are dispensational. What do we mean by that? It's talking about the dispensation of the Jewish people, of, the, of these uh, people that are the children of Israel. And it says about their election about their coming to the kingdom, about the blindness that came on them, and about the opening of the door to the Gentiles. And after talking about that, you know, it's in that area where Paul the Apostle said, I have evidence of heart for my own kindred, for my own people, that is for the children of Israel. After talking about that dispensational thing, which is for the children of Israel, remember, first section, doctrinal. And then the second section is, um, is dispensational. This third section now, starting from chapter 12, is our duty. It's not talking about the duty, the dutiful part of the life of the Christian. That's why you'll find chapter 12, it says, this is what you do. In the church as ministers, in the church as workers, in the church as those who exhort, in the church as those who give, this is our duty, our duty to God. A duty in the church, a duty to the people of the world. It comes to chapter 7, uh, chapter 13 rather, a duty with the government. And it comes to chapter 14, a duty to our neighbors. And then in chapter 15, pray for me. He said, a duty to the ministry. Then comes to chapter 16, mentions all those other needs, those who have been fulfilling that responsibility and duty to other people. And so we're coming to this chapter 12. I'm looking at chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 12 of Romans, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove, that she may know, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see how it begins in this section, I beseech you therefore. That's what therefore. You must be find, you ought to find out first, why is that word therefore? Why is it there? Now, the, the way we, we preachers say that anytime you find a therefore in any verse, find out wherefore. Why wherefore? That wherefore means why. Why is he beseeching us? I beseech you, therefore. It says, because of everything I've said from chapter 1, because of the sacrifice of Christ, I beseech you, therefore. Because Christ gave up everything for you. It says, I beseech you. I plead with you. I'm, I'm pleading with you that this is what you ought to do. I plead with you, therefore, because of the sacrifice of Christ, because of the, the, the sacrificial lamb that gave himself for us and is substituted for us. And because of that salvation that he has given unto us. If you look at that verse, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He's talking of mercies in the plural. There's the mercy of God for salvation. There's the mercy of God for sustainers. There's the mercy of God for sanctification. It says, everything with God, there is mercy. There's saving mercy. By his mercy, by his love, by his compassion, by his grace, he has saved us. It says, not only because the mercy saved us, because the mercy reconciled us with God. All enmity is gone. And now we belong to Lord. Because of that reconciling mercy, I beseech you. He's saying there is sanctifying mercy to you. The mercy of God did not just save us and forgive us and cleanse us and reconcile us with the Lord. He has also sanctified us. He purified us. He makes us to have the very mind of Christ and the very heart of Christ. He says, look at the mercies that the Lord has shown unto you. Because of this mercy, I beseech you. Is saying he didn't only save us, he didn't only sanctify us, he has sustained us as well because of the sustaining mercy of God. That he has not left us on our own. That well, I've saved you, you go and try your best and be as good as you can be. He lives on the inside of all, he is a strength of the Christian life, he is the power of the Christian life. He says, because of his presence with us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Because of that sustaining mercy, I beseech you, therefore. I read that again. I beseech you, therefore. Now you know why the therefore is there, brethren. It's okay to brethren. Those who are born again. Those who are converted. And these are the people who are sons and daughters, members of the body of Christ. They are followers of Christ. They are disciples. These brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God, that should present... Your present to present means you are giving your body now as a gift to the Lord. It's like when you know during the end of the year you buy something for people and you present it to them. And when you are presenting a gift to somebody, you wrap it up very well. And then the wrapper, the, the wrapping that you are putting there is very attractive, so it's very, it's very nice. That he likes the wrapper, he likes the content inside. You see, there are people uh, that say, Well, I've given my heart to Jesus and my body doesn't matter at all. That's the wrapper. That is, your body is the visible part of you. We don't see your soul, we don't see your spirit, we don't see your heart. We see that on the outside. It says that outside thing that covers the spirit and the soul, you are presenting that to the Lord as well. It's a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. It's a holy sacrifice, not an unholy sacrifice. It's an acceptable sacrifice, not an unacceptable sacrifice, and it is unto God. It's not to self, it's not to the world, it's not to any community, but it is unto God, and this is your reasonable service. What's that saying? That if we say we're serving God in any other direction, we're worshiping God in any other direction, if this presentation of your body as a sacrifice, holy, living, acceptable unto God, if that is not there, then the service is unreasonable, unacceptable. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. 
That is, do not be in the mold of the world. Do not allow the world to make you into its mold. But it says, but be transformed. That's what transformed there is the same word that was used as transfigured. That Jesus Christ went to the mountainside. And then he was transfigured before those three disciples. The same word here. He was be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As it talks of the external, the outward, the body, in verse 1, it talks of the internal, that is the inner man, the man, the, the mind, in verse 2. And so we're looking at uh, these uh, two verses now, and we're looking at what the Lord himself will have us learn, not only to learn, but will have us do. I'm talking to you on these two verses on the believer's consecration and non-conformity to the world. The believer's consecration and non-conformity to the world. He wants us to consecrate ourselves and present ourselves unto him and not to be conformed to the world. And uh, before we look at the three parts we're breaking the message to, I want to remind you, of uh, James chapter 1, James chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You want to ask yourself in this, uh, year, this new year, what do I want to be for Christ? How do I want to live for Christ? In what way do I want to move forward in my practice? In what way do I want to move forward in my following after the way of the Lord? How do I want to practice the word of God, obey the word of God, learn the word of God? And how do I want to conform myself to the word of God in this new year? Remember, if we always think the way we always thought, we'll act the way we've always acted. And if we always act the way we have always acted, we're going to have the habit we have always formed. And if we maintain the same habit we always had, we're going to have the same result in life that we always had because the thought leads to the act, the act leads to the habit, the habit leads to the character, the character leads to the destiny. It begins with the way I think. The way I think about whatever is around me. The way I think about whatever I feel. The thinking will lead to the act. The act will lead to the habit. The habit will lead to the character. And the character will lead to the destiny. So if I want my destiny to be what it ought to be, it means that the way I think on the world, act on the world, behave according to the world, and the way I live my life according to the world must be different from what it was in the past. I pray that this year, every one of us will move forward in Jesus' name. Again, the topic is the believer's consecration and non-conformity to the world. Three points we're going to consider. Number one, the living sacrifice. The living sacrifice. Number two, the lifetime separation. It's not just a separation of a moment, of a period, of a day, of a week, of a year, is a lifetime separation. And then number three is the Lord's sanctification, that transformation, that transfiguration, and that makes us totally different and totally new, the Lord's sanctification. Number one again is the living sacrifice of our body unto God. The living sacrifice of our body unto God. It's, it tells us there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that she presents your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Point number two, the lifetime separation of believers from the world. The lifetime separation of believers from the world. You see that in verse two, and be not conformed to this world. And be not conformed to this world. If our goal is heaven, if our inheritance is heaven, and if we want to spend eternity with the Almighty God and with Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior on that other side in the next world, it says, for this world, be not conformed to this world. It's a lifetime separation of believers from the world. And point number three, but be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Lord's sanctification of brethren in the will of God. The Lord's sanctification, the sanctification that he does for his own people, his own children, the purification and the inner cleansing makes us whiter than snow. What he does for his own children, the Lord's sanctification of brethren in the will of God. I come to number one, the living sacrifice of our bodies unto God. And you'll find that there are many people who claim to be Christians, and the understanding of the Christian life is, I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've given my heart, I've given my spirit, my soul is deposited into the hands of the Lord. They say, you may not see a difference on the outside. You may not see a difference on my body. You may not see a difference on my actions. But the point is, I know what is inside me. You may not, you are not able to get inside me. I know I'm a child of God. Well, that's, uh, it looks like a fine, like fine talk, but it's unscriptural. It's not real. Why? Because how do we know your heart without the actions of your body? For example, when you are sad, I can't know you are sad except by the words your mouth will speak, except the tears I see coming out of your eyes. That's how I know you are sad. And how do I know you are happy? It's your mouth, your laughter, your smile. How do I know you are excited? It's by the actions of your body. How do I know you have a purpose, you have a goal, you have something you are doing? It is the action of the body that makes me to know what's on the inside of you. That's what makes you to know also how you express yourself. That's why the body is also very important. And the Lord is now telling us that if we are real children of God, God, if we are brethren, if we are converted and we're members of the family of God, I beseech you, I beg of you, I'm pleading with you. He's saying that I, I don't want you to receive the grace of God in vain. I don't want you to receive the salvation of God in vain. Therefore, I'm pleading with you, begging of you that therefore, because of the saving grace of God, because of the sanctifying grace of God, and because of that sustaining grace of God, brethren, by the mercies of God, that she presents your bodies a living sacrifice. It's actually making use of the language of the Old Testament. The Old Testament people will bring an animal and then they'll sacrifice that to the Lord and they'll present that before the Lord. And he's saying now that the way they did that in the Old Testament, they brought animals. Animals are no more acceptable. Now it's your body. It's yourself you are bringing to the Lord. You present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, have you noticed the sacrifice of the Old Testament? They never present only part of the animal. They present the whole animal. And when they present the whole animal, it's totally given unto God. And it's saying that you present your bodies as a sacrifice. But it says, a living sacrifice. There's something you notice about the sacrifice of the Old Testament. The Old Testament people bring their sacrifice alive. They never bring the sacrifice dead. A dead uh, animal cannot be presented before the Lord. You must present that sacrifice when it's still alive. And you present the sacrifice complete before the Lord. And he's saying now, no more animal sacrifice is now yourself. Jesus Christ gave himself completely. And when he gave himself completely, it's so that you too now will present yourself unto God a living sacrifice. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever done that? Have you gone to the altar of the Lord saying, Oh Lord, now I'm born again. Now I'm a child of God. Because I'm a child of God, you have saved me, you have cleansed me, and you have given me a brand new life. And I want to present my body unto you on the altar as a living sacrifice. Then it says, if it's going to be acceptable that it's a living sacrifice, it will be holy. That he is, I'm presenting myself to the Lord, and this presentation I make to the Lord, this gift I'm giving to the Lord, is holy. Now, what does that mean? When it just says, I present my body to the Lord, my body, my head, my intellect, I present it to the Lord. But the intellect, my head, I'm presenting to the Lord 
must be holy. I will not fill my mind and my brain with uh, pollutions and pornography and defiling things. I was all those things swarming about and swimming in my head. I then present the head to the Lord. Then my hand. I present my hands unto the Lord. And I'm saying that this hand will do holy things. This hand will do righteous things. This hand, I'm presenting my hand to the Lord. That's my body. I'm presenting my feet before the Lord. And I'm saying the places I will walk to. And the places I will move to, they are the places that will glorify God. They are the places that will exalt and honor the holiness of the Lord. I'm presenting my tongue before the Lord. That little member that causes great havoc and great destruction uh, in community. I'm presenting that tongue before the Lord. And I'll speak of righteous things that will encourage other people, make other people holy, make other people want to move on. Nothing that will discourage other people. I'm presenting my body unto the Lord. He says it must be a living sacrifice, not dead or deadened or killed or destroyed or damned by defiling things and holy before the Lord. And then he says it will be acceptable unto God. It will be acceptable unto God. The other word that is used in the Old Testament for acceptable sacrifice is a pleasing sacrifice. That the Lord will set down the fire and the fire will consume that sacrifice and he'll say that sacrifice was acceptable and pleasing unto the Lord. I want to show you that the New Testament talks about our body being presented before the Lord, not just you know our soul, our heart, that our body that expresses the action and the and the thoughts of our mind that body must be presented before the lord in romans chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 12. romans chapter 6 from verse 12 let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body you see that in our mortal body in this body that is susceptible to weakness and tiredness and even sometimes sickness that will eventually die. It says in this mortal body that we must not let sin reign over this body. You know what that means? You know, sin does not come like, you know, coming from the sky and then saying, I am your Lord, I'm grabbing you. What it means is, let not sin reign in your hands. That is the work of your hand, what you do in your office, the things you write in your school, and the things you do with your hand. Make sure that sin does not take hold of your hand, control your hand, and then do sinful things through your hand. It means not let sin take hold of your feet, that your feet will walk to places of sin and places of degradation and places of immorality and defilement. Let not your mouth say the things that are sinful or the things that will lead other people to, okay, if it is like that, let me go on sinning. Let not sin reign in any member of your mortal body. That she should obey it in the laws thereof. Sin will come like temptation. Sin will say, why don't you try this? Why don't you turn this? Why don't you steal this? Why don't you grab this? Why don't you hold this? You know, that's fire. It will lead to the fire of hell. And I've learned to run away from fire. That your body, the members of your body will not obey. Look at verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments. You know, he talks about the body in verse 12. And then he says, when I talk about the body, I'm talking about the members of your body, your hand, your feet, and every part of your body. Neither yield your, your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves. You see what he's saying? He calls it the body, and then he calls it members of the body, and he calls it your very self. Isn't that your personality? Isn't that you are? Isn't that what you are? What you see, what you look at, with your eyes, what you hear, with your ears, what you give your mind to, what information you allow to come into you, what you speak, with your mouth, with your tongue, and what you hold or what you handle with your hands, and where you walk to with your feet. That's your personality, that's, that determines you, that describes you. And it says, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive, from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And that's what it means when it says to present your body. You present members of your body in a very definite way. It's like, you know, the Old Testament people again, whenever they brought a sacrifice of the Lord, 
they will not take that sacrifice from the altar and then go and give it to another god again what the lord is saying give me your body completely and you will not take that body members of the body and give it to gossiping again you give it to god you're not going to give it to drunkenness again you give that body to god you're not going to give it to smoking again you give it to god already you're not going to give it to marijuana again you give it to god already you're not going to give it to lesbianism homosexuality or anything anymore it is presented unto god and unto god alone it must not be unto god for righteousness and look at verse, verse 18 being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 11, uh, verse 19 rather. I speak after the man of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. That's just saying that because of your low understanding. That's what was telling the Romans. And then it says, For as ye have yielded your members, servants unto uncleanness in the past, and to iniquity, unto iniquity before you were born again, even so now that you are born again, even so now you have received the saving mercy of God, the sanctifying mercy of God, and the sustaining mercy of God, even so now yield your members, servants to tell me righteousness unto holiness that, that's what he's saying when he said present your body a living sacrifice unto god and what understanding does the new testament give us concerning our body look at chapter 6 of first corinthians first corinthians chapter 6 first corinthians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 19 and so that we have the proper understanding what, what, what does uh, the Lord think about our body? You know, some people feel the body is just the body. And whatever you do in the body doesn't really matter because it's your soul. That's what they say. It's your soul that matters. Not at all. The body matters in the sight of the Lord. Look at chapter 6, verse 19. Watch. Know ye not that your... Watch. Tell me out loud. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You see that? It says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit dwells inside us. The Holy Ghost lives on the inside of us. He makes our body the temple. He wants to see through my eyes. He wants to hear through my ears. And he wants to learn through my, through my ears. He wants to do something through my hands. He wants to go places. The Holy Ghost doesn't just go to places. He goes through my feet. That's what, why, what he's saying. That's why I say, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? He, tell, he tells us that this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That if, if you are born again and the Holy Ghost is living on the inside of you, you must be a temple of the Holy Ghost. A temple is a house of worship. That means that it is through you. The Holy Ghost will dwell. He will reveal the mind of the Father. He will reveal the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you are able to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It says in verse, in verse 20, Ye, for ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought with a price. Now some people think only my soul is bought with a price. Only my spirit is bought with a price. But look at that verse. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. That, that part is bought as well. And in your spirit which are God's. Come back now to verse 9. Now you understand that it's talking about a body. And talks about what we do with our body and what we shouldn't do with our body because that body is born that spirit is born the totality of the man spirit soul and body is bought by the lord look at verse 9 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived the, neither fornicators, that's what uh, sinners do with their body, nor the effeminate, that's what they do and they express with their body, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuality, that's what they do with their body, nor thieves, that's what they do with their body. 
you know, if a person does not have time so to pick up something, how can it be if it, it does it to the body? Not the covetous, not drunkards. That's what they do with their body, not revilers. To revile, to abuse, to insult somebody, they do it to the members of the body. No extortioners. They do it to the body. All those sinful things, all those dirty things, all those defiling things they do with the body, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But she are washed. I pray that her washing, her cleansing will be real to everybody around us in Jesus' name. And he are sanctified, but she are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He tells us then, look at verse, look at verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Again, he talks of our body. And so that, that means then that when we consider our Christian life and our Christian understanding, our Christian doctrine, our Christian duty, we know that our body plays a part in serving the Lord. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an hallowed? What follows? Tell me out loud. God forbid, don't you know what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot, a sin partner, and harlot, a man, a woman that gets you into sin, is one body for two city shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, flee fornication. Run away from fornication, despise fornication, reject fornication, any enticement to fornication, reject it. Every sin that a man doeth is without outside the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And you know the Bible talks very much about different parts of the body, very definitely. And you can check up later on your own, but let me just show you a few verses of scripture. We're looking at Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I'm, talk, I'm looking at verse 37. You see here, it talks about the eyes. So it picks up, the Bible picks up every part of the body. Check up your Bible, your hands, your feet, your ears, your eyes. And it tells us how we are to commit all this unto the Lord, the way we live. Psalm 119, verse 37, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Where's the vanity? On the television. Where's the vanity? On the internet. Where's the vanity? All over in the world. Where's the vanity? In the theater house. Where's the vanity? In the pop houses. Where's the vanity? In the nightclubs. And it says, turn away my eyes from beholding. I'll not even look at those objects of temptation. From beholding vanity and quicken me in thy way. Uh, let, let's look at uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. The Lord uh, himself in the word picks up uh, different parts of the body. And he tells us uh, how we are to present this body. I presented my eyes before the Lord, so I'm not going to allow my eyes to look at things that are defiling. In Proverbs 23 verse 12, Apply my heart unto instruction, and thine ears to the words of knowledge. He talks about our ears now. That the words that will come into your ears, they are not the songs of the world. They are not the things of the world, the utterances and the communications of the world, the watch of the Lord that brings the knowledge, knowledge of salvation, that makes knowledge, knowledge of the holy, holy demand of the Lord and brings the knowledge of the power of the Holy Ghost in our life, knowledge of our responsibility of evangelism, knowledge of the teaching of the word of God, all these messages that we allow them to get into our ears all the time, and ears to the knowledge, to the words of 
knowledge. Uh, let's look at First Peter chapter 3, First Peter chapter 3, and see what the Lord is telling us about another part of the body, a member of the body. In First Peter chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 10. It says, He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. It talks about our eyes, present that to the Lord. It talks about our ears, present that to the Lord. It talks about our tongue, present that to the Lord. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no girl. Have you any time deliberately come before the Lord and say, Lord, like the children of Israel made their own sacrifices and they know they presented before the altar. I'm coming before the altar of the Lord. Lord, I present my eyes to you. From now on, I will look at things only that glorify you. I will not look at things that will defile my mind. I will not look at things that will remind me of the old lifestyle. I will not look at things that will remind me of things of the world. I am presenting my eyes before you. And I am not going to give these eyes to Satan to make use of anything. I am presenting my ears before you. The songs I hear. The messages I hear and the things I hear with my ears, there will be things that will lift up my spirit, encourage me in the way of the Lord, encourage other people in the way of the Lord. And it will be something that will glorify the Lord. I'm presenting my mouth before the Lord. It's not for gossiping, it's not for slander, it's not for lying, it's not for deception, it's not for a false doctrine. I'm presenting my mouth before the Lord and my tongue before the Lord. It will not do any evil or say any evil thing. There will be no deception. There will be no girl. We're coming to uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 27. Then later I'll back up to verse 23. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 27. Turn not uh, to the right hand or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Remove thy foot from evil. You will see that the scripture has not left us in the dark. It talks about every part of the body, members of the body, and it says this is what to do, and this is what not to do with members of the body. Let's come to verse 23 of that Proverbs chapter 4. Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, perverse leaves, put far out, far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. You see, it's mentioning the eyes and the mouth and the lips and the ears and the eyes. And it says, let thine eyes look right on and thy eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. And let's look at Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 15. And those who will see the Lord in that faraway land, those who will see the Lord on that glorious day, you have presented your body as a sacrifice before the Lord. It's a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, and it's an acceptable, pleasing sacrifice. Those are the people that make use of the members of their bodies in a way that glorifies the Lord all the time. That you know that this year, there is a presentation sacrifice you are making before the Lord, and you're sacrificing this to honor the Lord. In um, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 15, it tells us, He shall dwell on high. His place, uh, in the verse 15, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppression, that shaketh his hands from holding a bribes. In your place of work, you, you shake your hands from a holding of bribes. So keep your hands from holding a bribes. You restrict, restrain your hands from beholding a bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. All those um, kind of uh, horror films on television, horror films on 
uh, whether it's YouTube or whatever, or a film Sunday on the net. It says that you will stop your ears from hearing of those of blood and shut up his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks, and the bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. Then eyes shall see the king in his beauty, and they shall behold the land that is very far off. I pray you'll behold the land of the Lord eventually in Jesus' name. Psalm 24, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24. Verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? It's asking for those who will get to heaven eventually, those who will live forever and ever with the Lord. And he tells us, these are the people, he that has clean hands. You see that? Clean hands. No bribery, no corruption, no fighting, no violence. No stealing, nothing that you do with your hand. You're not picking up anything that is going to defile your body. It says, He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, and he has not sworn deceitfully. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, he tells us from verse 1, as he tells us in verse 1, he says in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, are you born again? I'm pleading with you. Are you a child of God? I beg of you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. It may not be acceptable unto man. Man may have a different expectation of you. Man may have a different thing he wants you to do. It says God is number one in your life. And God is preeminent in your life. And therefore, you are not, you know, here and there. You are trying to please God and trying to please man. He says, forget all about men. Whatever they want, whatever they do not want. In any case, we know that what pleases God will not always please man. But you are to think of what is acceptable and pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. Point number two, the lifetime separation of believers from the world. The lifetime separation of believers from the world. And it says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. What does that mean? When it says, be not conformed to this world. I want you to think of the children of Israel once again. Because in verse 1, when we think about the sacrifice, we're thinking about the sacrifice of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And it brings that to us now. And it says, you are not presenting animal. You are presenting your very body. Now we come to the Old Testament. They came from the land of Egypt. What was the Lord telling them when they came out of Egypt? Do not be conformed to Egypt again. You've lived all your life in Egypt. You were born in Egypt. You were raised in Egypt. You know their language. You know their culture. You know their practice. You know everything they were doing. You know their gods. You know their idols. But it says, do not be conformed to Egypt anymore. Now, the world, Egypt represents the world. And it's telling us, be not conformed to the world. Number one, it means, do not be converted back to the world. Do not be converted to the world. Are you saved already? You are converted by the power of the Lord. And now you are converted into the kingdom. You have to live the kingdom life. Do not be converted back to the world. It means, uh, be not conformed to the world. means, do not copy the world. You are not copying the world. Not copying the world. In their dressing style, in their feasting, in their merriment, in their nightclubs, in whatever it is they're doing. It says, you will not copy the world. Be not conformed to the world. It means, be not converted back to the world again. It means, be, be not copying the world in your style, in everything that you do. Number three, it means, be not committed or consecrated to the world again. Be not conformed to the world. They'd like you to commit to them. They'd like you to say, this is what we're interested in. Show interest. And this is what we're excited about. Show some excitement. And this is what we like. This is what we want to do. Be not committed to the world. And be not consecrated to the world anymore. Be not concerned about the world. You know, the world will always like you to think about them. 
They want to catch your attention. They want to make sure that you are thinking the way they are thinking. They want to make sure that you count them significant. You count them important that anything you want to do, what will they think about this? How will they appreciate this? How will they evaluate this? How will they think of this? Be not concerned about the world. That's what he's telling us. He's telling us, be not conformed to the world. He's telling us, be not converted to the world again. He said, be not be copying the world, anything you are doing. And be not be committed or consecrated to the world. Be not, be con be not concerned about the world. Leave them alone. Whatever they think, that's their business. In any case, you are a stranger in this world. Are you a pilgrim going on your way to heaven? It is be not controlled by the world. Don't, don't allow the world to control your mind. Control what you look at. Control what you see. Control what you eat. Control the way you think. Control your mode of life. There are people that go to church. There are people that read the Bible. There are people that claim to be Christians, but they are under the control of the world. 166 hours of the week. With two hours of the 168 hours of the week, they go to church and they sing and they, that, that's all. Only those two hours, the rest of the time of the week, they are controlled by the world. And everything is totally for them of the world. They are thinking of the world, they are thinking of the world, they are picturing the world, they are they must in the world. But the Lord is saying, be not controlled by the world. It says, not cleaving to the world, not cleaving to the world. And what the Lord is saying here is that now you are married to Christ. He is the bridegroom and you are the bride. And therefore you leave to clean. You leave the old system and you leave the world and you cleave unto Christ now. That means you are not cleaving to the world anymore. It says, not crooked like the world. Not crooked like the world. You see, there are people, all the, all the fraud of the world, they still practice. All the crookedness of the world, they still practice. All the, all the practices of the world, they still get involved in. But they're not the same. Be not crooked like the world. And that's the, like, read this again and see if you understand better. And be not conformed to this world. And be not conformed to this world. And that's what the Lord is teaching us. And I pray that we'll be so different from the world. Even the world will know that we're different in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a good amen over there. Amen. The lifetime separation of believers from the world. And let's see what Jesus, what Jesus said concerning you, concerning me, concerning those who have given their lives to him as Savior, as Lord. In John chapter 17, John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 14. In John chapter 17, verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I, Christ, am not of the world. At any time the world is trying to make you into their mood, any time the world is trying to get some commitment from you, any time the world is trying to get your attention as to you know, be thinking of them and concerned about them and what do they feel, what do they want, and they want to control you and they want to mold you into the way they think. You ask yourself, will Christ do this? Will Christ think like this? Will Christ go there? Will Christ view this? Will Christ be interested in this? If Christ will not be part of that, you will not be part of that, he says, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. There's evil in the world. There's sin in the world. There's Satan in the world. There's defilement in the world. Uh, there is uh, anti-Christian principle, anti-Christian laws in the world. And the Lord is saying all those things are evil. I'm praying that you'll keep them from the evil. In verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray that you'll reflect the life of Christ on earth in Jesus' name. Actually, when he saved us, he saved us from this present evil world. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. It says, Grace be, on, grace be to you, 
and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This present world is an evil world. And you'll see that from the violence, you'll see that from all the bad things they do. And you see the people of the world, they, they seem to even glamorize the evil things they do. And that's why you have the holy wood or lowly wood or this wood or that wood. Why? Because all the all the things that we know are evil. What you call it adultery, call it fornication, call it sensuality, call it worldliness, whatever it is, these people they dramatize and they, and they try to even expose it more to the world and make it uh, something uh, uh, that, that has uh, that should have, people should have interest in. And that's why you have all those uh, uh, home video, home video and this video and that video and they're popping it out more than ever before that if you say you are not uh, going to watch a uh, television now you can download it on your ipad now you can watch it on your desktop now you can do this and that and they have all this and they're saying publicizing everywhere and sometimes they'll try to put some uh, christian thing there mention the name of jesus mention christianity and then inside you say a lot of dirty things and the lord is saying this present evil world, they want to impose all these evil things on you. They are not going to heaven, and they say they want to now empty the church. As we are trying to evangelize them, they are trying to, what are they trying to do? They're trying to evangelize us so that they will bring us into their mold. They will not bring you to their mold in Jesus' name. It's an evil world, and they are very serious about wanting to get the church back to the world. They will not get us. They will not get you in Jesus' name. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God, our Father. It tells us in... Um, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 27. It is a very serious verse of scripture. And look at this in James chapter 1. It says, Pure religion, verse 27, undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself, not to make an effort, make an effort, to keep himself unspotted from the world. Keep himself. How do you keep yourself away from the world? And number one, you close your eyes to you know things that is not that is beyond your control. That is the thing is there on the street, and you cannot you know clean up all the street. You close your eyes to that. The the prostitute is staying at the corner of the road there, and you cannot go and physically throw her away from there. So you turn away your eyes from beholding vanity. You keep yourself away from that. Or the billboard is there in the public, and you cannot go there to go and disconnect it because you don't have a right to do that. And so you keep yourself away from that. You close your eyes from that. Uh, that that's on one side. On the other side, there are you know you use uh, the desktop, you use uh, computers, you use laptops, and all those things. And sometimes you'll find that while you are doing something, a bad thing will come out. And then he says, if you're going to keep yourself from being unspotted from the world, either you erase it or you know you you get it up, you, you get it away from yourself. That's what the Lord is saying. That you will keep yourself unspotted from the world. Or is the old girlfriend that is trying to, you know, I've not seen you for a long time. What, what happened to you? Where have you been? And then you know that this fellow wants to get your back to the evil again. It is yourself now. You'll keep yourself a spotter from the world. Say, I'm born again. I'm a child of God now. All those uh, kind of relationship, all that is cut off. I pray that you'll do it in Jesus' name. The Lord is coming. And because the Lord is coming, that's why you need to make an effort. And I pray the Lord will help you. He has saving grace, remember? He has sanctifying grace. He has sustaining grace. He'll sustain you in Jesus' name. Uh, we're looking at, uh, for, at John, uh, this James chapter 4, verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God? That's why he says, be not conformed. 
be not converted back to the world, and be not committed or, cons or consecrated unto the world, and be not uh, be not concerned about the world, and be not uh, you know controlled by the world. Do not cleave to the world, and do not be crooked as the world, because. Enmi the, the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is who? The enemy of God. In Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. It tells us in verse 20, for it after. They have escaped the pollutions of the world. You see, as you read the New Testament, it's talking about the sin in the world. It's talking about the evil in the world. It's talking about the perversions of the world. It's talking about the pollutions of the world. Now, it says, see, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. There's a possibility that... You were saved before, and now you'll be free from the world. You're free from all the interest. Those things of the world don't reset you anymore. They are pop houses, or they are nightclubs, or they are women, or they are men, or they are nakedness, or they are scanty dressing, or whatever that, that you know they present to the world. You're not interested anymore. But if you begin to take interest again, they are entangled again, they're in and overcome the latter end of them is worse. It's worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his vomit again. You'll not come back to your vomit. And the soul, the swine, the pig that was washed, wallowing in the mire again. You will not go and wallow in the mire anymore in Jesus' name. And that's why it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, this is a commandment straight from the heart of God. Love not the world. Love not the world. Love not the world. All those things, you will not, you will not even have any secret interest in them. Any secret desire for them. Any secret liking for them. And it will not be, oh, uh, I'm a Christian. Why? Well, not because I'm a Christian. I really love this sin. There will be no love in your heart. If Christ lives there, if Christ controls your heart, if you're not the control of the Spirit of God, love not the world. Not, not the things that are in the world. If any man, if any man, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. The love of God and the love of the world cannot be in the same heart at the same time. The love of righteousness and the love for righteousness cannot be in the same heart at the same time. The love for the Savior and the love for holiness and the love for sin cannot be in the same heart at the same time. The love for Jesus, our bridegroom, and the love for the old sin partner cannot be in the same heart at the same time. If you love Christ, the love of that same partner of the past is no more in your heart. If you love the Lord, the love for the world is no more in your heart. It says over here, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All, all that are in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. I pray you will not pass away with the world. The world passeth away. You have received the message from our pastor, Pastor W. F. Kumoye, the general superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the old world and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O oh Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week, and the one we are going to listen to the next week, by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. If you tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.